I'm delighted to be here this evening in this absolutely beautiful setting. I've never visited the Tabernacle before, and it's um, yeah, just wonderful restoration. Really interesting what they've done with it. Um, I'm going to kind of start by actually, uh, Viv probably won't like this. I'm going to start by apologising uh, because we're going to go, <laughs> we're going to enter this evening with quite a hard topic, the hard topic of fate or destiny. How much of our lives are predetermined? So it's, this isn't going to be a light and easy one, uh, but hopefully some of the others after me might be slow slightly more um, breezy. Um, okay, so the concept of fate or destiny is something that has fascinated humanity since our species first arose, rose, really. It's something that across cultures, across geographical boundaries, across different religions, people have really been interested in the idea that maybe we are free agents. We can go about our everyday lives making decisions without any constraints in terms of the choices that we make, whether it's from what we choose to eat uh, to the people that we surround ourselves with, the careers that we might want to follow, and uh, how our lives might lead out, how our life trajectories might form. There's another idea that perhaps we are more, we're closer to being pre-programmed machines, driven by desires or driven by processes that we're not fully aware of. Perhaps we're more like puppets, uh, and the master is somewhere up there pulling our strings and making our decisions for us. These two different opposing views um, have fascinated theologians and philosophers and many people throughout our civilization. But more recently, neuroscientists such as myself have joined in the study of this subject. And the reason that we can start to probe the concept of fate or destiny now is that we can now start to peer into the brain as never before. We can start to watch it, conscious, moving mammals go about their daily lives and make decisions. We can peer into the brain as these mammals are, are navigating the space around them and making choices. Um, and we can see what happens to some of the 86 billion or so nerve cells that are in our brains, how each one of these nerve cells operates by pumping in and out sodium and potassium ions to cause a current, an electrical current or zip of electricity sparking across that nerve cell um, and each one of those nerve cells can connect to up to 10,000 other nerve cells, um, and this electricity fizzes across these different junctions between the nerve cells and um, allows our circuit board of thought to uh, arise within the connectome of our mind, which contains about 100 trillion connections. So basically, all of the time, your brain is taking in information from the outside world using its senses, converting that information into electrical activity, and then processing that information, integrating it together within your existing um, framework of reality, within your existing framework of your connections between your nerve cells and your brain, in order to give you rise to your conscious thoughts, to give rise to your emotions, and also to, to instruct you on how you're going to interact with and react to the world around you. Um, and as we peer into this connect home of our mind, as we go about making decisions in life, we can see some really fascinating things. And the results are making us really question um, what it means to be human and what it means to be a conscious agent within this world. And another point, important point to note at this point is that each one of you has a very individual, very highly personalized cartography of the mind. A very, those hundred trillion connections that I was talking about within your mind this ele electric circuit board that operates within your brain, its design, its architecture, varies from individual to individual. Each one of you, every person in this world, has a very different connectome. And it's that that sets us apart and allows us to lead such varied and interesting and very different lives, that, making different decisions throughout uh, um, ourself. Um, scientists 
very, very recently have developed this incredible technique which allows us to peer into the brain and watch as this connectome, this electric circuit board, is actually being built in the developing brain. In a human baby, 20 weeks gestation. Um, so 20 weeks before the, the baby is even born into this world, scientists can peer using different scanning technology, um, passing through all the amniotic fluid, correcting for any movements that the baby might be making in the womb, um, and start to build up a map of the individual connectome for that baby before it's born. And what this research is, is very much in its infancy, but what this research is showing us is that even for this baby, before it's emerged into the world, there are different signatures within that circuitry, within that connectome, that act as a foundation for the way that that baby's life might transpire to be. And the research at the moment is very much focusing on medical um, conditions that are diagnosable, but it's seeing that there's, there, are these, there are these anatomical foundation signatures for conditions such as autism, for example, and even for conditions which might emerge or symptoms which might emerge 20 years later from this baby. So different um, brain signatures can exist for, for example, schizophrenia, psychosis, um, depression, and anxiety. And this mapping of the brain for this individual um, is starting to give us some insight into how some of our behaviors are very much ingrained. At the same time, there's been a revolution in technologies in terms of um, genomics. So being able to sequence the 3.2 billion base pairs that make up our blueprint for life. We each hold very individual DNA coding, which instructs how our bodies and our brains will be built throughout our life. And uh, for less than $1,000 now, and in under 30 minutes, we can now se sequence those 3.2 billion base pairs and find out what your individual instructions are for your body and your brain to be built. And what science is increasingly showing is that there is a high hereditary basis for not just your physical um, traits, for example, your height or your eye color or your hair color, but also more complex cognitive capacities. So, for example, there seems to be high hereditary basis for your food preferences, your uh, waste measurement, um, also things like, for example, your intelligence, your longevity, um, even your socioeconomic status, and your well-being or your resilience to mental ill health conditions. There seems to be increasingly, we seem to be discovering that there is a high genetic component, component to a lot of these complex um, cognitive capacities, even things like, for example, impulsivity or compulsivity, or whether you, um, the number of friends that you might have in later on in life, your friendships um, styles and groups. Um, now, that doesn't mean to say that once you are born, or once the egg is fertilized by your mum and dad, that's it. There is no scope for change. Everything is written and predetermined completely within you. That's not to say that at all. And scientists are increasingly discovering that both nature and nurture, this ability for um, the environment to shape uh, uh, future, and nature, the way that our biological DNA and our brains are kind of built, these two things are not opposing aspects of this idea of destiny and fate, and actually, nature and nurture are, are utterly intertwined. And there's been some amazing research in the last 10 years by a guy called Kerry Resler, who's up in America, and he's been looking at how the structure of the DNA can change in grandparents and how that's, that change, not in the coding of the DNA, but the structure, the co configuration of it, can alter how it's expressed, and that can alter your behavior. So he did some really, really interesting, neat studies looking at mice. Now, mice usually love the smell of sweet, sweet cherries. They get very excited by the smell of a cherry, thinking that there is a nice, nibbly little treat that they can go and eat. Um, they get very motivated by the idea of it and will start scurrying around looking for where this cherry sauce is. Kerry, uh, rather um, meanly, 
um, wafted in the smell of sweet cherries into the mice where the mouse lived, and, um, and then followed it with a mild electric shock. He did this a few times, and the mouse learned. It went against its evolutionary ingrained uh, behavior to seek out this nice cherry treat. Instead, it learned to tense up its muscles in anticipation of a mild electric shock as soon as it started to smell the smell of sweet cherries. Um, now, Kerry stopped doing this after a while. The mouse learned quickly, as we all do. We do learn quite quickly when we're given a mild electric shock, I would imagine. Um, uh, and so he left the mice to have this wonderful life. The mice paired up, had a family, and then he left the, the children of that mice to have a wonderful life as well. Um, paired, paired, they paired up and had some grandchildren of the original mouse. And then he did something. He wafted in the smell of sweet cherries into the grandchildren's um, house, and he was expecting them to get very excited and to think about a nice cherry nibbly sweet to eat. But instead, even though they had never observed the grandparents um, freezing up, they'd never observed this ob observation of an electric shock paired with the smell of sweet cherries, instead, these grandchildren just automatically froze up in anticipation of the mild shock. And in this way, and, and he discovered the mechanism by which this occurred. So what happened was, instead of there being a change in the DNA from the grandfather, what was happening was there was an epigenetic change which was altering the configuration, the shape of the DNA. It was um, changing it so that enzymes could access particular genes, which then changed the way the neural circuitry was being um, laid down in the pups and the grand pups' brains, so that instead of the olfactory, um, the region that's involved in picking up smell, olfactory nerves sending the circuit to the nucleus accumbens, which is an area of the brain involved in motivation and pleasure and reward, instead it sent an area, uh, the, the line, the neural circuit pathway, to an area of the brain called the amygdala, which is involved in the fear response. So this is how this memory was being passed across generations epigenetically, not in the DNA, but through behavior behavior, through learnt behavior. Um, there's been some really recent studies just in the last couple of weeks looking at how a, a new mechanism by which this kind of transgenerational memory can occur. Um, studies looking in C. elegans, which is just a little worm, um, showing that there's little RNA molecules which accrue and accumulate in the sperm of the C. elegans, um, and these RNA molecules basically block the expression of very particular genes. So the DNA isn't being changed, but the environment is causing the grandparents to um, produce these different changes in, way that, in the way that that DNA is expressed. And in this way, you can get transgenerational memory. It's thought that there's scope for similar mechanisms to exist in humans. Um, now, I'm not just saying that, uh, you know, we are given our DNA from our ancestors, um, and we, there, there can be some effect from the occurrences that have happened with our grandparents and the parents and the grandparents before them. Um, obviously, we are not just you know, limited in what we can learn from life based on our uh, um, ancestors. We can learn new things every day. And this is brain plasticity. This is the way that our brains can actually make new connections between individual nerve cells in our mind. As we learn something new, a new connection will form out form, um, to form a memory, um, and then that connection will form a major highway throughout the mind, um, which becomes a new way that we can think and a new habit in our behavior that can form through these new connections forming within our mind. And you can see in this movie here, this is proteins that are involved in new connections forming between nerve cells being shuttled around so that memories can be made as we learn from our environment um, and start thinking in new ways. However, um, our brain, because it uses so much energy, actually uses 20% of our daily energy quota, it starts to, um, doesn't take in all the information all the time and convert it into electric signals. It filters quite a lot of information based on our prior experiences. It makes assumptions based on what we've learned before. Um, and this is a really neat illusion that helps to demonstrate that. So this is a hollow mask of Charlie Chaplin spinning round and round and round. And the shadows are telling you at the back end of the mask 
that the eyes are going backwards and the nose are going backwards. But because you are used to seeing faces, your brain just ignores those shadow cues and instead perceives another face poking out, when in fact, it's the back end of the mask. There's another, um, I don't know, hopefully that is working for everybody. There's a more kind of dramatic version of this here. So even though the shadows are telling you that it's the back end of the mask, you're so used to seeing faces that instead of forming a new connection, trying to um, f um, perceive this information in the way that it actually really is, your brain is making assumptions, it's taking shortcuts and it's processing in order to give you this illusion of another face popping out. There's another um, audio illusion that really neatly demonstrates this as well. So if you take a listen to this. Pretty much gobbledygook, right? Mo the majority of you here won't be able to make sense of this. If you now listen to this second sentence, which has a similar cadence, but makes sense. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. Poor camel. Um, if we now return to the original sentence, your brain will suddenly overlay prior information and make sense of it. It's incredible how quickly your brain learns and makes assumptions based on your prior experience. Now, if you imagine that each one of you has a unique DNA, these 3.2 billion base pairs, each one of you has an, a unique connectome with 100 trillion connections within your mind, each one of you has scope for plasticity, but that is based, and your perception of the world is based on your experiences before you can start to see that actually maybe we're going on an avalanching amplification of what we were already born with, what we were already predisposed with. Um, because our sense of reality is actually not real. It's based on our past experiences and the way that our brains are built. And that informs all the decisions and choices that we make on a daily basis. Um, to give rise to our life stories. Now, I'm really running out of time completely, but I want to say that we are not a sea squirt. A rudimentary sea squirt basically um, floats around in the ocean, uh, and um, eventually it will decide to implant itself on a rock. It's a hermaphrodite, so it can s exist in a solitary kind of um, space just implanted on a rock, uh, and so it can just reproduce with itself, and it kind of eats all of the little debris food bits that go past in the currents. Um, so it implants itself on the rock, and then it decides to digest its own nervous system. Basically, it eats its own brain. Now, we are not like that. We as humans are driven, we are pre-wired to derive pleasure and motivation from going around and discussing things with other people and exploring the world with other people. And so I would like to think that neuroscience is telling us not that we should be disappointed or disempowered by the fact that maybe we are closer to pre-programmed machines than free agents. Maybe actually all of this information could be quite empowering to allow us to think a little bit more, practice the art of self-reflection, take advantage of a pause button which might exist within our brain according to early studies, and hold compassion for others, appreciate neurodiversity, and exchange ideas, talk about our unique perception of the world, and take on board other people's views. So I would like to think that neuroscience can be quite empowering and positive.